Welcome to everybody, and this is a panel titled Performing the Bach St. John Passion in 2022. Why is it great? Why is it controversial? I'm Pamela Dallal, co-director of Emanuel Music's Bach Institute. Tonight, we propose to delve into the reasons why Bach's St. John Passion continues to be discussed and experienced in our current society to ask what elements of the piece disturb us, what aspects move or uplift, uh, uplift us, and how we reconcile presenting such a work to the public, given the controversial nature of the text and the music. I'm joined by a distinguished panel who will tackle these questions for us. The Reverend Pamela Wernz, Rector of Emanuel Church in Boston, Professor, Professor Joshua Jacobson, founder and director of the Zamir Chorale of Boston, Ryan Turner, artistic director of Emanuel Music, Charles Blandy, Emanuel Music member and this season's evangelist, and Carrie Sharon, Emanuel Music member and mezzo-soprano soloist in this season's passion performance. We'll begin with an exploration of the history of the gospel narrative and how it relates to historical events and the various times that this work intersects. Jerusalem circa 33 AD, Jerusalem circa 70 AD, Luther's Germany, Bach's Germany, and 21st century Boston. I'd like to invite Pam to begin. And make sure you're um, unmuted. Right. Thank you. It's a, a humbling thing to be asked to introduce the Gospel of John because it's a literary work that's widely known, at least by its famous lines or scenes, but whose authorship, date, and audience are hotly debated. We we can't actually get back beyond the gospels before the gospel accounts to the life of Jesus, the life and death of Jesus. It is, so we can't, we, we can only get to what we can surmise from the writings that have been left behind, which are not in agreement. So I can report scholarly opinions, but that doesn't mean we know anything for sure. All we know is that we don't know. And I feel that more deeply every time we engage Box St. John Passion. The Gospel of John is widely considered to be the last written of the four canonical gospels. That is the four gospels that made it into the Christian, what Christians call the New Testament or the Second Testament. And the Gospel of John is usually dated around the end of the first century between 85 and 95 in the common era. The gospel says that it's written by the disciple whom Jesus loved, which doesn't necessarily, and probably, it doesn't mean necessarily, and it probably doesn't mean that there, that, that person was an eyewitness. Scholars usually assign the location of the completed gospel of John to Ephesus on the western coast of modern day Turkey. The audience might have been assorted Jesus followers who needed encouragement and strength to continue to do the right thing in the, mix, in the midst of larger threat that was going on with Rome. Or the audience might be Israelites who remained in the area around Jerusalem after the city and the temple were destroyed in 70 AD who were in conflict with the way, the best way forward. They were in conflict about now that the city has been destroyed, what should we do? And, and there, were, there were clearly conflicts about how to move forward. The purpose of the gospel is stated at the end so that you, the reader, this is a quote, so that you, the reader, may come to or continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name, end quote. So that you may have life, so that 
you it's not so that you may annihilate those who don't agree with you it's so that you may have life and it's that coming or continuing to believe that i want to stay with for a moment because biblical believing always means beloving it means how is love enacted how is belief in god or belief in jesus how is that transformative and how is that loving and in john we especially hear that emphasis much more than the other three gospels in john we hear for god to love the world in john only in john do we hear a story about jesus tying a towel around his waist and watching washing the disciples feet only in john do we hear jesus's um, command for the beloved disciple to take care of his mother and for the mother his mother to behold her her son who's going to care for her and it's ex is explicit in the experiences of resurrection with mary magdalene the love that she has for jesus is highlighted in the scene in the garden that's only in the gospel of john the um the what i call the great fish fry at the end of the gospel of john where where the disciples are on a boat and they see someone on the shore cooking breakfast for them. And they don't know who it is, but they think it's Jesus, but they don't recognize him. It's very confusing. Peter takes all his clothes off and jumps in the water. Um, and, and Jesus says, the, the Jesus character that is unrecognizable says to Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, I love you. And, and asks three times, do you love me? And every time that Peter says, you know, I love you, the Jesus character says, feed my sheep, tend my lambs, tend my sheep, you know, take care of one another. And so it is particularly hideous and heinous that the Gospel of John has been used for as a source and justification of so much hatred, and especially anti-Jewish rhetoric and anti-Jewish hatred that, um, well, we'll get, we'll get to Luther in a minute, but there's the other thing I want to say before I turn it over to Josh and Josh, I'd love to hear your take on this. I don't think that there's a way to escape the anti-Jewish or anti-Judean sentiment in the Gospel of John. We can't translate our way out of it. Yudeoi means Judean and it means Jew. And in John, sometimes it means the leadership and sometimes it means the people, but it means the people in and around Jerusalem. It doesn't mean all of, you know, all of Judaica, you know, around the Mediterranean. Um, and we, we can't fix it. And so I want to give Josh a minute to, uh, to respond to that and then share his sense of the historical context of the Gospel of John from his perspective. Yeah, thanks, Pam. Um, you know, you say that uh, we don't know very much about uh, the facts at the time in the life of Jesus, but sometimes maybe even more important than the facts are the way the facts are perceived mm -hmm. in different eras. So let's try to peel away some of these uh, layers of history. Uh, we're talking about uh, Jerusalem, as you say, around the fourth century. Uh, whether we call them Jews or Judeans, these are people who live in the province of Judea, which is, ro uh, which is uh, ruled by, by Rome. And Herod is the local governor, and basically he's a puppet of the Roman Empire. And uh, he's the one who appoints the high priest who is mentioned in the work that we're talking about. And we know um, from the Talmud, the Jewish Talmud, that says that this was a very corrupt high priest at this time. We also know about this time that there were many uh, radical Judeans who were promoting a revolt against Rome. And, uh, of course, that resulted in the big revolt that uh, resulted, as you mentioned, in the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70 and the second revolt in the year uh, 135. Rome was not particularly happy with those who wanted to revolt against. And the punishment, of course, was severe, was, was crucifixion. There were many, many crucifixions at the time. Also, we also know that there were many religious sects around this time. Perhaps the most famous 
is the Essenes who lived in the area of the, of the Dead Sea around the same time. So the Gospel of John, of St. John, is written after these events. We don't think that he was an eyewitness uh, to what happened. But, but as you mentioned, this was a time when Judeans were trying to figure out how to continue. With the temple destroyed, the Israelite religion was no longer. And so we come up with what's called around this time Rabbinic Judaism. And we have this conflict now between Rabbinic Judaism and Christianity, although it was not called Christianity at, the time, this, at that time. These were Jews who believed that Jesus was uh, the Messiah. Nobody wanted to incur the wrath of Rome. And so if you were writing something, you did not want to place the blame of the crucifixion on Rome. Instead, you would place the blame on the other, which would be the Jews who were not following uh, Jesus. In fact, we see that John depicts Herod almost as a nice guy, as a reasonable, per reasonable person. And everything else we know about him through the writings of Josephus, etc., <laughs> says just the opposite. And unfortunately, uh, Pam, you, you, you pointed out the, the lovely things that we can take from the, the book of John. However, there are some things that are a little bit more offensive. Uh, every time he mentions the Jews, and I, it's around 70 times that he mentions Jews in, in, in the Greek term that you mentioned that I can't pronounce, um, they are seen as the spawn of the devil, and they are always evil corrupt and evil. And interestingly, the ones he does not call Jews are Jesus and the disciples of Jesus. They are set up in contradistinction to the Jews, although from everything that we would know at the time, of course, they were Jews and Judeans as well. So back to you, Pam, for the, for the next level. Thanks. Well, yeah, I would say they were Jews and Galileans for the most mm -hmm. part, and not Judeans. Um, but Galilee was but part of the Jews. province of Judea. Right, right. So, but there, there is some, there is some conflict between Galileans and and those in and around Jerusalem. So, so the, what the point I think that you're making is right that there's a lot of conflict that is represented in this text that we can know some things about, but we don't, and we can surmise. Uh, we know from extra canonical accounts that Pilate was notoriously violent, that the leadership of the temple was corrupt. There, though we, have, we have evidence of those things, and then we can deduce other things. And certainly it was never going to be safe to accuse Rome of violence in, in storytelling or in writing. And you know, Pilate is kind of portrayed as a hapless bureaucrat, um, like who, whose hands were tied and, and nothing could be further from the truth. And ironically, it is Pilate in the Gospel of John that says, what is truth? Or, mm -hmm, right, Herod and then Pilate, yeah. Pi yeah, he, he goes, right, but it's Pilate who says, what is truth when Jesus right. says that right. he's come to testify to the truth. So it is a very problematic text. Now, the plot thickens when Luther translates into German and starts out thinking that people of Jewish faith should be treated kindly and gently because that's the way to win them over to conversion. Mm -hmm. And he has this um, fantasy that that when they really when they hear the gospel when in the vernacular they're going to be persuaded on mass you know that, that there's going to be this great conversion and and that does not pan out and he gets more and more angry and bitter and and murderous in his language about um about the evils of judaism and he leans on the gospel of john but he doesn't. But he doesn't start there. He just goes there, um, and and ends his life having written horrible 
libelous things about Jews and um, and about the need to protect Christians from Jews and about the the um, he, he writes about burning homes and synagogues and mm -hmm. um, it's it's very very violent rhetoric and he is you know the author of the Christian Reformation on the on the continent of Europe and um, the, his work is amplified by the printing press. So the way we think, I mean, I'm jumping ahead to the 21st century, but the way voices are amplified on social media right now and, and untruths are, are spread, um, that, that's kind of the, that's what happens with the printing press. Josh, do you wanna say something about Luther and, and his time? I'm afraid I do. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's this notorious uh, pamphlet that he writes in 1543 called Of the Jews and Their Lies. Right. And as you mentioned, he advocated in, in his frustration that the Jews were not doing what he wanted them to do. He advocated the burning of synagogues and the burning of the burning of the Talmud. Um, but I think the other thing that's going on here from from what I read is that Luther is also having his conflict with Rome. And he wants to equate the priests of the temple in Jerusalem, the Jewish priests of the temple in Jerusalem in Israel, with the priests of Rome of his day. And so he took that conflict and pasted it on top of that historical conflict. And I think that colors um, how he viewed uh, the gospel of, uh, of St. John. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he, was, he was railing against the Jews, the Papist, the Muslims, etc. They were all lumped into the enemies of the religion that he was creating. Right, that's right. Um, since you are the professor of music, I wonder if you want to move into the music of Bach and Bach's treatment of the St. John Passion, and then I'll, I'll respond. Sure, sure, sure. So, I mean, we don't know, did Bach ever meet any Jews? Uh, there may have been some uh, merchants and perhaps some traveling around, but uh, hardly any contact that he would have. His knowledge of Jews would be from what he read in the Bible. And generally the concept there was the good Jews were the ones who lived before the time of Jesus and the bad Jews thereafter. Now, perhaps we can see Bach's attitude in his treatment of the crowd scenes. Uh, the term often used is the, the turba. And these are scenes in which an angry mob of Jews is crying out, for Jesus to be crucified. The, the, what it reminds me of is, is the, the, the film of, of Frankenstein with the townspeople coming out and calling for him to be destroyed with their torches and everything. And, and that's what these crowd scenes sound like in Bach's mm -hmm. St. John Passion. And I, I just want to add on a personal note, I, I conducted this piece once in, in, in 19. 85. And I was grappling, of course, with all of these issues and, and trying to make it a teachable moment for my students at the time. But during the performance, during one of those turba, those crowd scenes, I had this incredible sense of identification that I was there. I was part of the music. I was part of that crowd as I was conducting, as I was conducting that scene and that those choruses and that i think that speaks to the power of the music as well as anything else that's going on mm -hmm. and and i want to contrast the torba choruses with the chorales because mm -hmm. the chorales make it very clear that the congregation who is hearing this telling of the passion narrative is there. Bach does that musically and he does it with text. He, he chooses texts that, you know, for our modern day Christians um, 
the the hymn that we sing on Good Friday is, were you there when they crucified my Lord? You know, and the answer is yes. It's a rhetorical question. Yes, we were there. We are a part of this. And the chorales make that very clear that the, the, the ones who did this are we, you know, we, we are guilty. We are taking this on. Jesus did this for us. It, it is, um, it's very personal. And, um, and Pan, it, if I, if I can jump in just, just to follow yeah. up on that, we need to remember the context of Bach wrote this to be performed in the church as part of a service. And part one would be the start and perhaps some other chorales added. And then there would be the, the sermon and then the part, the part two. So as you point out, the chorales, whether the congregation would sing them along with the chorus, we don't know, but they certainly could identify that. They put a different spin on the blame uh, for everything in the context of this uh, of this work. That's very true, very true. I just want to note that there would be a very long sermon between part one and part two, and I have not been invited to deliver that sermon this year, but, <laughs> but maybe in the future. I hope you're already um, drafting one, Pam. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, oh gosh, I just lost the thought that I had written right out of my head. Oh, I wanted to say, right, I just want to reiterate what Joshua just said, that that even if the congregation wasn't singing the chorale tunes, they knew them by heart. Mm -hmm. And so it was a way to bring them into the, the, the story and, and to feel a part of it. It's very, very powerful for, um, for people who have sung hymns their whole lives, you know, knew the hymn tunes of the chorales before they could read and so it's a powerfully emotional way to bring people into the story and then just taking it up to the present time as we as we look back um we're certainly aware of of centuries of of persecution of jews uh, often by christians because jews refused to accept the divinity of christ or christ as the messiah leading up to 19th century um, racial anti-Semitism, and then, of course, to the Shoah. So after the Shoah, after the Holocaust, how we approach this is, is totally different. I think there's, there's a, a new sensitivity to what's going on in this work. There were those who have advocated that we change the lyrics, that we change the libretto. Uh, do we substitute in, in German, Leuten for Juden? Just say, it's the people rather than the Jews. This is what Lucas Foss famously um, um, advocated for. But can we really change a great work of art? Do we spoil it if we do that? Can we just maybe accept that this is a flawed work of art uh, in terms of its libretto, but a great work of art in terms of its music? But I just want to throw something out to the panel, and that's... Um, how do we deal with other works that, that do this? For example, can we sing, can we perform the songs of Stephen Foster today with their image of blacks? What, what about works that, that disparage blacks, Hispanics, gay people, Asians? What do we do with that? And I think we have to look at this work from that same, mm -hmm. same perspective. Thank you for that, uh, Pam and Josh. Um, it's a fantastic uh, framing of our conversation. And I think that what we see in partial answer to Josh's question is a, a, a culture that is trying to rectify this by, um, by canceling, by, by moving things away from performance and, and shelving them. Um, this is, I think, a, a very poignant question with this piece, which, as Josh pointed out, is part of a ritual. It's part of a, 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 a reverence that Christians must observe the narration or the, or the recitation of the Passion story on Good Friday. And this piece is a musical sort of elaboration of that ritual. So in, in a sense, it can't go away, at least it can't go away in in the church, but, but
but the question again is as a concert performance um how how do we address the way this work has been perceived um what i'd like to do now is is move into a closer look at box work itself um so to to ask the question um we understand that this is the narrative but but what is what is it that bach does to this narrative that makes it uniquely his how does he clothe it in music um i'd like to hear from the panel about the structure of the piece what are the elements we heard already about the chorales um but there's a question of um the positioning of the chorales um the framing of the work what are other elements that Bach adds to the narrative and how does he organize them? What does he emphasize or what does he minimize? And what effect does this organization have on the experience of the piece? Um, so I'd like to turn that first to Ryan. Thank you, Pam, and thank you, Josh and, and Pam Wertz for everything you've done to add to this discussion. Um, the structure of the St. John Passion, that could be a whole panel discussion in itself or a complete lecture, or even a, a class. Um, I'll try to be brief here. Um, one of the things that I've always found to be the most sort of astonishing about the St. John Passion is the structure, especially as it relates to, in essence, four different layers of time that are ha all sort of colliding together. Um, and this is an important part of the structure, and we've touched on it to a degree, but we first have the biblical narrative, which is mostly sung by the evangelist. Um, and then there are, as Josh mentioned, the turba choruses, which are also a biblical narrative, but that is when the narrative is within groups of people. Whenever groups of people say something within the St. John Gospel, it's given to the choir to sing. Um, and of course, there are the words of Jesus as well that are as an, a narrative, um, as restative. And then we have a, the role of Pilate, and then a few other characters. There's Peter, and there's a a servant, and a a quote maid um, that have biblical texts. So that's you know the text from the Gospel of John, as Pam mentioned, eighty five to ninety five A.D. The second layer of time of structure are the chorale tunes, which were most of them from Luther's time, so we're looking at 100 to 200 years old, but were familiar hymns and familiar, familiar tunes and familiar texts to Bach's congregation. The third layer of time are the arias or the meditative texts, which were contemporary, was contemporary poetry that Bach set to in a, in a concerted form, not recitative, not a chorale, not a chorus, but a solo aria. And then the fourth layer of time is, of course, for the listener now. Well, I guess one could also say five layers of time because there was the listener the first time it was heard in Bach's congregation, and now every time there's a performance, the perspective of contemporary listeners. So as we talk about the perception of this piece, it's important to keep all those that complexity of the layering of time together. Um, through the narrative, the structure of the piece is such as Josh mentioned, it's in two parts, and it would have been a, a long, probably about an hour long sermon in between the two parts. Um, within the first part, it's sort of divided into two different parts. There's the arrest and then Peter's denial. Then we would have had the sermon. And the second part is divided into three parts, essentially, the trial before Pilate, um, the crucifixion and death, and then finally the burial. Bach, in essence, uses, a, we've talked about a sort of almost like a horror movie concept and where he paces, the dramatic pacing is such that it will hit a fever pitch in a way, and then at that very moment, he drops in a chorale or perhaps a meditative aria, which is the contemporary Christian's reflection on the events that have happened. One of the things Pam Wernz mentioned is the idea of love in the Gospel of John. 
And I've always found it interesting that the very first chorale that Bach chooses to put in there, the opening words are, O Grusalip, O Great Love. And then it goes on to say, O Love Beyond Measure. Um, the other, there, there are sort of three chorales. I could talk about them all, but three that pop out to me. The first is that one. The next is this idea of who is responsible. Um, and the response from the chorale that Bach inserts is, he says, Wer hat dich so geschlagen? Who has struck you? And the response is I, I and my sins. I meaning all of us, the congregation, the people in attendance. It's the idea of that human sinfulness is to blame more than anything else. And then the third chorale, which sort of stands out as the central message and the central point of the St. John Passion, and especially in the second half, there's a sort of palindromic structure. And right in the middle of that chiastic structure is the chorale Durstein Gefängnis, which is basically through, um, through your imprisonment, Christ, surely freedom must come to us. And that, you know, and I can, I don't want to preach here since there's a preacher in front of me, um, but is essentially the message of human Christianity is that through uh, Christ's death and resurrection, we are all set free from sin. Um, so he drops in these chorales in interesting ways, often when the drama is at its height, either a chorale or it might be an aria that he drops in at this fever pitch. Back to the horror movie concept, I'm always thinking about, there's a stretch of three meditative, heart-wrenching, the most beautiful arias in the piece happen in sequence, essentially. And it the first is um, the one, in fact, that uh, Carrie will be singing, um, Es ist vollbracht, right at the moment of, not at Christ's deaths, but at the moment when he himself says, Es ist vollbracht, meaning, often translated as is it is finished um, or perhaps it is completed my work here is done essentially and then the drama stops the alto sings this poignant aria that then leads us to this idea of the hero judo judah arising um and then after that there's a very very brief recit that the tenor sings and we go into a bass aria mein toya highland which is asking the question, is it true? Does this mean that I'm, my sins are forgiven, that I am free? And there's this childlike nature to it. And I've always thought embedded in it is another chorale that I hear as the song of Peter. To go back to what Pam Wirtz talked about, this relationship between Peter and Christ, um, there's a, a naivete, I feel, to it and a the the sense of love that's there and the fact also within the saint john passion bach also takes two passages from matthew and plops them in it's the only time he does that and one of them and perhaps the most important one is peter's penitent weeping that happens in the first half after he denies christ three times and then the evangelist charlie has this incredible arioso of Peter's weeping. So I think this, the connection between Peter and Christ is, is palpable. And we hear it also in my Torah Highland in the chorale. And then after that, we have the temple being torn asunder. And we go, which also comes from the Gospel of Matthew, and then leads us to the sort of the image of the mother at the foot of the cross weeping and said, Felisa, here I am drowning in my tears. Now what? What happens? So we have this energy that takes us to the crucifixion and death, and then time stops. It's like a freeze frame. And where the Christian, the believer, is meditating, um, reflecting on what does this mean for them personally. The final thing I will say is that in the Gospel of John, there's significant amount of time spent on the burial and the sort of solemnity to it and the tender ritual surrounding the, 
the burial. And the piece ends, or so we think, with this gorgeous C minor lullaby, Root Vol, which is, you know, incredibly touching chorus, um, which feels like the end. But it's almost as though there's a double epilogue <laughs> and that then we have another final chorale, which again, I see as the intent of that is to bring it back home to Bach's audience at the time or now for us to our audience and what does this mean for us? Josh, you wanted to ask a question about um, where some of those poetic texts come from or, or you have some information to share. Hmm. Right. Um, what we know is that there was a history of passion plays that were going on for many centuries before Bach writes this. And in fact, there were texts of these plays that were set to music by other composers. Uh, the most uh, famous or perhaps notorious is the, the Barocus Passion. And what we see is that when Bach chose his texts, and, and we're not sure if he had help with this or if he, he wrote his own text, but he did not use some of the worst anti-Jewish texts that were in the previous Passion plays. And I, and I think uh, I, I wanted to add that to, to what uh, Pam and I were, were talking about. And certainly it's, it's, it's relevant to what Orion is pointing out in terms of the, the structure of the piece. The, what is not there? What is not there? Um, and I, I just wanted to um, make a few observations on what Ryan was saying. The, the fact that Bach changed this work several times during his life, and most significantly the very year after its premiere. So it premiered in 1724, and in 1725 he presented a, a very different version um, where that final chorale in particular was replaced with a very different chorale-like movement that was the German Anus Dei. So a, a, a piece that was really all about asking for mercy. Um, so I think that, that Bach's struggle perhaps or, or um, various different viewpoints I think also weigh into the way we perceive this piece. And I'd love to hear more from Ryan about that. I, I was just going to say, I've always found it interesting that, so this was Bach's first year at Leipzig when he writes his St. John Passion, his first um, Good Friday there. And he revised it four times. And we also believe there may be a fifth incomplete revision. But the last revision happened in the last year of his life. This was a piece that was he must have struggled with and he kept close to his heart from 1724 all the way until 1749 at least. This is so different than the St. Matthew Passion, which was a completed work and never touched again in that fashion. So um, I'd like to invite any other members of our panel to weigh in on some of the experiences that you as performers or um, as listeners have had in the the way that the piece is constructed you know sort of this um what ryan was talking about the the way that a um he brings us up to a, a fever pitch and then interrupts us with a chorale or an aria um because i think that these are some of the most vivid, um, memorable aspects to the piece that are obviously engineered by Bach for, for us to, to have a response to. So um, I'd love to open that up. Um, I, I guess I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so I've, I've sung the evangelist a number of times. I've actually done a couple of the different alternative uh, versions of the arias. I've done the sort of the canonical uh, uh, version of the arias, which has Ach mein Zinn and Er Vega. And then there are two other arias that I've also done once or twice, and they're <laughs> very, very difficult. 
Um, so, but one of the things I think about, about the pacing of it, it's very, St. John is very strange in that the first half, it's not even a half, the first section, you know, again, before the, as we mentioned before the, the sermon um, is quite short and it's very snappy getting up to that point. And the other thing is that at least I find that um, John's prose is much more snappy and it leaves out, it seems to leave a, a lot out. And there's sort of, there's a lot of kind of dangling factoids, like, you know, the fact that Peter gets, you know, draws a sword and cuts off the ear of the high priest and the priest's name or the, or the, or the, or the high priest's servant. And the, the servant's name was Malchus. And it just sort of leaves it there. And that's kind of, that's, that's a fact. And I don't really know why it's there, but there, and there are other things that sort of seem like references to things that, that perhaps the audience might have known. But in any event, the, the first half ends very, very abruptly with this uh, um, very dramatic and pained aria uh, sort of in, in the voice of, of Peter. Um, and then so much of the rest of it is, at least from the evangelist perspective, is, is narrating and setting up these very, very dramatic and, uh, um, and, and terrifying choruses, uh, the turbo choruses. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the structure of it is, is um, it, it's a little bit um, confusing or um, it's, it's not what you would expect. I, I always sort of feel like when talking about the leading up to, you know, putting you into this frenzy pitch and then shutting it all down, it, it, there is this, um, I feel that way actually about the arias as well. Like you get really excited being in the chorus and it's, you know, um, recit, chorus, recit, chorus, recit, nothing, <laughs> you know, like we are so engaged and so involved in the, in the process of what's happening. And then, and then there's this parenthetical, um, now I'm gonna talk about it moment, where I, I understand why it also adds length, which is, um, you know, everybody needs a calm, peaceful moment, but it, it does sort of, um, I don't know, the drama certainly takes a back seat for a moment in a way, you know, the purpose is to keep the drama there, but by breaking up this, the continuity so much it, for me personally, it does sort of, you know, put a damper on everything for a minute. You know what I'm saying? It's, um, I don't know. St. John is so interesting to me, um, for all the reasons Pam and Josh have been giving for the last 35 minutes. Um, but, um, Carrie, can I, can I jump in just to, yes. on, on what you said? Isn't that like the structure of, of an opera as well? Yes. We have the action going on, and then the action stops for an aria, where we kind of think about and meditate and express our feelings. And that's, that's so similar to the structure that you're, you're pointing out here. Yeah, I was, I was going through the, the, um, the passion again today and just spending a lot. I wanted to make sure that I really was in the right place for this conversation. And, and I actually had that exact thought. There are these as a as a a student of classical music we we have these funny little snippets that we say and one of them is park and bark and it's terribly offensive but it is not untrue that you get to these moments in an opera where you sing an aria and the information has already been expressed to the audience but you then have to sing it again for maybe seven and a half minutes depending on the aria where you just stand there and emote the same words for seven and a half minutes and it is just this sort of reprieve for the audience but i don't know it's it's like the con it's like the composer's opportunity to be a little schmaltzy sometimes and to just expand the i don't know the cushion so I want to suggest that that is a way of bringing the audience or the congregation into it more deeply. 
That's listening to a beautiful aria thinking oh it's really beautiful and then and then just getting more and more kind of i don't know sucked in to to this drama um i think ryan earlier on mentioned like a horror movie what happens you know the the device with horror movies to make you really scared is that the the movie script makes you laugh just before something really scary happens so your guard is down and if it were just chorus, if it were just chorus and recits, you would you would kind of build up this um, defense about what is happening. The story that's being told is not our story, but it's something that happened a long time ago. And the aria, you know, just kind of makes you sit back and and delight in this beautiful music, which makes you more susceptible to the chorale which reminds you that, oh, this is not about then. This is, I mean, yes, it's about then, but it's about now. Yeah. And it's about <clears throat> now, now in the 21st century, yep. which I think is a piece of the answer of why we're, why are we doing this? Because it's still relevant. It's still happening. Yeah. I'd like to jump in here as well. And I think that um, it it's a potential argument against staging the work because what is essential about the piece as dramatic as it is and it's unbelievably vividly dramatic is that the arias are clearly not meant to be sung by characters in the drama and and so there's there's this this as ryan said these levels of time um where where the aria soloists are speaking for our reaction after the fact and I suppose there's a way to say to that, but clearly these are dramas of the mind. Like the Greek um, chorus. Mm -hmm. In a way, yeah, except a, except a very, very individual thing. Um, I feel that, that Bach is intent for us to see ourselves in every character. And, and, you know, not only do the chorales serve that purpose and not only do the arias serve that purpose, but I think that the the rage and the justification and the the machinations and the mockery are all written and clothed by Bach in such a way that as they are delectable to the ear, they're also reminding us that these emotions live inside of all of us. And, and I want to say that for me, that is the justification for doing a piece like this that we have to continually say that everyone in this piece is us. I just wanted to add one thing about trying to think of what Box congregation must have thought as they heard this for the first time. And keeping in mind the context that there was no, basically no tradition of a sung passion in Leipzig until 1721 when Bach's predecessor Johann Kunau wrote a passion. Kunau's work was um, much friendlier, I say, I would say, than Bach, much more accessible. And I can only imagine what Bach's congregation thought. And I think to your point there, in terms of finding ourselves in this, there was a level of I can imagine them squirming in their seats and a level of discomfort and almost feeling that they were being assaulted or violated in some way. And I, you know, in my demented mind, I, I hope that was Bach's intent. <laughs> I think, uh, Ryan, just to jump on that, I think they, they, they may have felt implicated, which is, in fact, the point, right? Um, yeah, I, I think just to go back to another point, uh, th there was something about the, the pacing of the piece as well that I have found. And, and as I've done this a few times, I find myself more and more um, intrigued by this. And Ryan and, and Michael Beatty and I had a rehearsal on, on uh, the other day, and, and we were thinking a lot about this, about these points in which even the narrative actually, you know, following the gospel text, Bach will write the recit, and the narrative just seems to stop. And there seems to be just kind of a, almost like a, like a fermata on a rest, 
it's not written. It's not written that way, but there seems to be a stop, like where, where Pilate asks, what is truth? And you sort of think, well, I don't know, that's kind of a funny question. What is that? And it just sort of hangs there. It just sort of lands, lands with the thud. And there's another moment where, where Jesus says, Pilate asks uh, Jesus a question. He says, Jesus gave no answer. And what are we supposed to do with that? <laughs> and there's all of these moments where it's sort of like, well, we're just going to let that sink in for a minute. And, and I think that that's, you know, as far as implicating the audience and, and, and the, the, the power of the arias as a moment of reflection, I think that there's actually, for something that is so compact, so fast paced, it's actually, there's, 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 a lot of, uh, there's a lot of room for that in the piece, which is kind of remarkable. That leaves, that, I think that's part of what leaves such a strong impression. But, and the other thing about implication, sorry to go on. The other thing about, about implication is that as a chorister, as somebody who is singing these choruses, you really feel implicated and you feel sort of uncomfortable because these choruses are very strange. They're really hard. There is some wild chromaticism that I, I can't remember seeing any place else in Bach, which is really kind of saying something. Um, but they are, I mean, they're, they are one of the things that for a musician that makes Bach so special is that it's incredibly challenging music and it's challenging every single time you do it. It never becomes not, it, it, it's never a walk in the park, never. And um, I, I think that that comes across in the impression of the piece that, that is, that's given to the audience as well. Can I go back to something that Ryan had said earlier about how the congregation reacted to Bach's music? Uh, which may be the reason why he changed it right away for the for the next year. But isn't that one of the functions of art, to take us out of our comfort zone and out of the thoughts and the emotions that we're normally having and introduce us, to take us on a trip with these other emotions? And my God, Bach certainly does that. But it's also doing these things with art makes it a somewhat safer way to do it you know you're not addressing it as being personally involved you're seeing it in an artistic way whether you're performing it or in the audience it's a safe way of doing that another reason why i think it's important that we continue to do this in 2022 but actually josh something you said in the very beginning of um our session um really struck me when you said when you were conducting this piece you really felt like you were in the piece, in the crowd, mm -hmm. um, in the moment, and I think as a as a chorus member, that um, to me is what um, it's a very unusual place to stand, especially as a Jewish singer. I get asked this question constantly: Well, how how do you sing this music without, you know, you're Jewish? And I always I think to myself: Well, the person standing next to me is not. Jewish, but they're also not Christian. So why is that not a question that you and and the truth is, I didn't know the story of John. I, I didn't know any I mean, I didn't know there were four Gospels until I was maybe in my 20s. It never applied to me in any way. I had no idea that this existed. But to me, this was just a work of art. It was just like an opera or um, any other story. And I was performing the play. And so um, in some ways, I think it's important to remember that to at least a, a portion of our audience, it is still just a story. Um, and it has lessons and um, for good and for bad, the things that we are going to take from it are, um, are all different. Every listener has a different experience. But I think um, to me, it is a story. It's a monumental piece of uh, drama. And that's always an interesting place to sit when you do feel like you're actually in it, like you're in the crowd. And that um, may be the hardest part about sitting in the chorus and also being an aria soloist is having to play both of those roles where I am in this crowd and then everything switches. And I am the, you know, the Greek chorus on the side. It's um, 
these passions are really interesting in that way. You know, any performer, any musician who's a performer is going to do a lot of research and try to get into the structure, the history of the piece, the text of the piece as much as possible. And then when we are performing, we are performing. We are actors, we are in the role. That doesn't necessarily define who we are as people. And when the piece is over, we go back to who we are. But during that performance, yes, we are totally involved in, in the piece. And, and that's very important for me because, uh, Carrie, the same thing has occurred to me uh, as I've conducted this piece and masses and requiems and people asked me, how can you do that as, as a Jew? And, and that's exactly how. Um, I, in, in, a, in a way of maybe wrapping up our discussion, I, I just want to say something about the, the question of Bach's intent versus how we hear the piece in 2022. And I, we, we, we can't know everything about Bach's private hopes or um, intent for what he wanted people to feel because he'd never, he didn't leave us any writings. Uh, any any private um, reflections on what what he was trying to do, we can make guesses about what we knew of his um, view of Christianity and and his devout Lutheran faith. But I think that everyone on this panel would agree that music of this incredible power and eloquence has a voice that transcends the creator's intent. And we wouldn't be here talking about this if we didn't all deeply love this music. And what we feel in the music is that he's speaking directly to us. He's speaking directly to us whether we are faithful Lutherans or whether we are Jews or whether we are atheists or whether we are coming from a completely different perspective. There is such knowledge of the human state that's being reflected in this music and the ugly as well as the good. I mean, it doesn't take much to look at the, the long back and forth between the Turba and, and Pilot to recognize things that we have witnessed recently. And, you know, the, the sort of political power game that is, is, unfolding in front of us that in some ways Jesus is just a pawn in something that is even bigger, especially to Pilate, who is basically going to get this acknowledgement from them that our, we have no king but the emperor, but Caesar. Um, and he gets, he gains something in that, which, which I feel is almost his chief um, goal in, in the whole scene. So I think that we have the right and the authority to say this piece is saying something to us and we need to listen to it. Yeah, we need to listen and we need to wrestle. We need to inspect our own hearts. We need to take response. We Christians need to take responsibility and atone for the ways that the Christian church has colluded with the persecution of Jewish and other people, non-Christian people of all kinds. Um, but, but to stop performing it, it seems to me, is to take it out of the conversation and, and the wrestling. We, we can't get down to the least common denominator where we are we are looking at art that doesn't offend anyone or challenge anyone or disturb anyone or delight, you know, it's not equally delightful to people. I mean, that is the whole point, I think, of art and literature. There's no last word. It should be a conversation. Absolutely. And with that, uh, we would like to open it up to our um, viewers and listeners. Um, if anyone has 
a question that's been prompted by the discussion you've heard, we'd love to respond to you. And we'll take those questions through the Q&A. I think you can use that button on the bottom of your screen and Heath will um, read those out to us. While we're waiting for questions, I just wanted to throw something else out and that, you know, when, when we spoke about, uh, Ryan, you spoke about the, the congregation's reaction to the, to the performance. Bach was always complaining that he didn't have good enough singers, that he didn't have good enough instrumentalists, that, the, that, the, that there were too lax in allowing the children uh, who were his uh, uh, treble singers into the, into the school, the St. Thomas School. So I wonder, what was the quality of the performance of this tremendously complex work, as you've always, as, as all of you have mentioned, in Bach's time with these forces? He would be thrilled to be here today and to hear your performance. Phew. Well, that's, that, that's very generous of you, Joshua. <laughs> uh, if I, I, I wish I knew what those performances would have been like in Bach's time. I know that, you know, you had asked, posed a question to me offline about, uh, the idea of having the congregation invite the congregation to sing the chorales. The audience. Oh, the audience. The audience to sing yeah. the chorales. An interesting idea, you know, they would be singing just the tune because Bach's harmonizations were so outrageous and complex, especially for the time. I mean, I can't imagine handing out part books to a, an audience and say, you know, good luck, have at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the... Um, and I just want to go on something about the idea of performing this piece now. And I think that there's a timelessness to Bach. There's a timelessness to the messages. And unfortunately, as we deal constantly with corruption, misinformation, I mean, there was fake news in... <laughs> 33 AD, essentially, that was part of the power struggle and part of um, what was so difficult for Jesus within this battle that was happening within the church and in the synagogues. Um, so I think that this piece is always valuable to do. And Charlie and I were having a conversation about the struggle about the anti-Semitism in this and is it offensive and how do we handle this? And I think one of the things that's important is the opportunity to have the conversation and reclaim this gospel of John and make it be, you know, Pam, you talked about the elements of love in the gospel of John. I think we have to have a broad conversation about this that is not just directed towards that and part of art is discomfort. I'll just, uh, maybe that's a great place to conclude, but I'll definitely endorse that when it comes to Bach. And when the, <laughs> you talk about uh, what it must have been like for the musicians of 1724, uh, for those Leipzig musicians. And I can only imagine that quite a bit of their week was filled with sheer terror from receiving a new cantata by Bach every week for two years, mm. which was incredibly <laughs> virtuosic and, and just mind bog, many of them mind bogglingly uh, uh, difficult. And then to receive this piece of work, which it doesn't really surprise me that Bach sort of wanted to um, keep polishing it and, and uh, working away at it. I think of a lot of his work from that point is so incredibly brilliant at that point. And it's also a little bit gnarly and a little bit thorny and has some rough edges to it. St. John definitely had some rough edges in a way that Matthew and the B minor mass um, have maybe, maybe somewhat less they're very ornate, but but not not so much of the of the the gnarly imperfection and the and the um, and the immediacy of John. And I think that that's sort of like what's scary about about a lot of his work. But it's really what what hits us in the gut too. We do have a few questions. Um, I have a question um, here. It says, "I find the question from Pilate, what is truth, to be one of the great mysteries of this story." 
What do the mm-hmm. panelists make of this question and Jesus' silence to it? I just want to say, what are the chances that Pilate really said that? But then, does it matter? I, I completely agree with you, Joshua. And I would say that rhetorically, what John is showing John's audience is that Pilate was looking at the truth. That, that John claimed that Jesus was the truth. And Pilate wouldn't know truth if it was standing right next to him. And, and that's, that's the dramatic way of making that point. Um, and Ryan and I were talking about this on Monday. Sorry if I could jump in on that. But, but it's not only does he not recognize the truth that's in front of him, he wouldn't have any use for it if he did recognize it. It's simply not a concept that he's familiar with because he's a politician. And that is, it, it, he only knows what is useful to him in the moment. The idea of something being absolute is, it's, it's just beyond his ken. And in fact, that question comes on the heels of a conversation about kingship. You know, he, Jesus, they, 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 he, Pilate says, are you a king? And he says, well, this is what other people say about me. My job is to witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth will hear my voice. And in, in, to my ears, he deflects the question because the, the name of king is meaningless to what Jesus is intending to bring. But to Pilate and to the corrupt um, priests, he represents a political danger. And that's what king means to them. And, you know, so there again, we have this conflict between what the message really was meant to be and what it get, becomes distorted to be. Uh, I want to share one more comment. Um, somebody says, what about places in the USA and elsewhere where there is no conversation like the one we're having, where the music is used to enforce the cruelty of the passion in its otherwise worst interpretation? Glad to hear that Bach didn't use those, but there are many who don't feel the discomfort and the struggle. This is history, they say. She, she shares with us. Um, any reflections on that? Can I call on Pam Wernz? <laughs> because Pam, there's, and I, I don't want to misphrase it. I know that in the, uh, um, uh, I'm the, the name is, you have a, f- a phrase that you've said about violence in the name of Jesus is, is the worst betrayal of of jesus ever perpetrated that um i think that's what you're referring to that yes that violence in the name of jesus is is a a a gross betrayal of what jesus message was Um, across all four gospels it's a message of love and mercy and forgiveness and repentance and right relationship and and jesus is quoting the Torah and the prophets. I mean, that that much is clear. Well, then what the gospel writers do with that, and then what the church does, and then when the church gets in bed with the empire, you know, it all goes downhill pretty fast. Um, But, you know, there are places where the conversation is not happening. And, you know, and and that is a, a great sorrow to me. I mean, there, there are all over the world, not just in this country, there are places where, where the conversation has stopped, where where people aren't free to express unpleasant, you know, unpleasant to the empire, whatever the empire it is, whoever is in power is not willing to engage with the dissent or, or the complexity, and and that is a tragedy. And and keeping in mind, you say performances today in other parts of the world where there's no conversation. I suspect that before the 21st century, there were very few performances anywhere in the world and anywhere in the history of the performance of the St. John Passion that dared to have this conversation or cared to have this conversation. Right. That's right. Well, thank you all. I think this has been a brilliant and most stimulating discussion. Um, I I want to point out that um, in a few days on Monday evening at 730, 
I will be giving a presentation that will pick up on some of the threads that we've just talked about, particularly though that complex of three arias that Ryan mentioned. I'm going to be uh, taking us through that passage as an exploration of the experience of grieving. Um, at, and and my, my thesis is that we can see this as the experience of an individual dealing with loss, not necessarily as the story is telling us, the loss of the beloved and, and revered God figure, but just simply human loss. I think that the music um, is very eloquent on that, and I hope that you will join me. And um, if, if at the end of my talk, I will be also taking questions. So if anyone watching this tonight um, is finding that there's still more discussion that you'd like to have, I welcome you to bring your questions to that event. And I'd like to thank our panelists one more time, Pamela Wernz, Joshua Jacobson, Ryan Turner, Charlie Blandy, and Carrie Sharon. And please, of course, come to hear the performance on Saturday evening. It's a potential argument against staging the work because what is essential about the piece, as dramatic as it is, and it's unbelievably vividly dramatic, is that the arias are clearly not meant to be sung by characters in the drama. And, and so there's, there's this, this, as Ryan said, these levels of time um, where, where the aria soloists are speaking for our reaction after the fact. And I suppose there's a way to say to that, but clearly these are dramas of the mind. Um, I feel that, that Bach is intent for us to see ourselves in every character. And, and, you know, not only do the chorales serve that purpose and not only do the arias serve that purpose, but I think that the, the rage and the justification and the, the machinations and the mockery are all written and clothed by Bach in such a way that as they are delectable to the ear, they're also reminding us that these emotions live inside of all of us. And, and I want to say that for me, that is the justification for doing a piece like this, that we have to continually say that everyone in this piece is us.